Timoth is the founder and CEO of Social Capital, whose mission is to advance humanity by tackling the world's hardest problems. Vinod is the founder of Kosla Ventures that focuses on impactful technology investments in software, AI, robotics, 3D printing, healthcare, and more. Joining them as the moderator is Kartik Talwar, one of the co-founders of Hack the North. We're so excited to have you back again uh, and welcome to the stream. Shabbat Vinod, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's uh, great to have you back. Um, I want to. Great to be here. <laughs> this is a it is a delight for us because uh, there's an interesting story behind how this got started. Um, as this 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 uh, meeting in general, uh, about a week ago, uh, Jamaat, you tweeted uh, about a, a conversation you have with Vinod on how uh, how much you respect him and how much of an impact he's had on your career. And uh, the kind of the, the anecdote I want to bring up and, and kind of start us off off is uh, when you were 19, you sent an email to everybody at uh, Kleiner Perkins and uh, asking for an internship, and uh, you didn't get a reply back from anybody other than Vinod. Uh, and even though it was a rejection, you got a reply, and, and you mentioned that this was a a uh, really big moment for you and you kept that letter for years. Um, I wanted to sort of start us off by asking, um, can you share a little bit more about that story? How did that happen? How's that impacted your career in venture? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the prelude to this was in high school. I worked at a company called Newbridge Networks, which was making, uh, you know, uh, TDM and ATM multiplexers. Uh, and it was run by this guy, Terry Matthews, who had before that started uh, this company called Mitel. <clears throat> and uh, so in Ottawa at the time, there was uh, Newbridge, there was Nortel, there was Mitel, there was all these technology companies. Um, and so I was kind of like exposed to, to tech and, and what a startup was. And I saw the success of a startup through Newbridge. And so, you know, uh, I was really just fascinated with the people who were uh, a part of that. And, um, you know, it was in my, I think it was in like my, to be work term, I was like, I want to be a VC. And so I kind of just, you know, you, you Google and you get pretty quickly to Sequoia and Kleiner's website. And uh, so I thought I would just email everybody. Or uh, I, 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 think I, um, I think I sent a letter actually, to be honest, a paper letter. Um, but the, yeah, the point is that, you know, in all of that, I got uh, a letter back uh, on Kleiner Perkins' letterhead. Uh, basically saying, listen, I don't hire summer interns, but, you know, uh, good luck to you. In fact, kind of some, something to the effect of good luck to you, let's stay in touch. I mean, had I had a smartphone, I would have even taken a picture of it, right? I mean, this is, we're talking 2001. No, 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 sorry. We're talking 1990, oh my God, 1996, <laughs> uh, 1995. Uh, some of you may not have even been born. Um, so, um yeah, it was just wonderful to get a response because uh, so basically the story is like, you know, uh, Vinod had started Sun and uh, and then um, uh, left. And there was an article that somebody wrote about him as he was starting Kleiner. And at the time, you know, things were really ramping. He had done Sarant and Sierra. I mean, I know all the deals that he did. This is how much like I had, I had been obsessed about this. Uh, and um you know, he had done he had done he done all this stuff in optical networking, uh, and again, I had come from telecom, so I kind of understood it a little bit. Okay, so there was this article that said that he had become obsessed with networking. You know, in this transition out of Sun and before he went to Kleiner, and the article said that he would fly back and forth to India, and he would just bring a bag of books and he would read them on the plane. And so, for whatever reason, I still remember this story. And VK, you probably don't even know this article, but it was like in Fortune or Forbes or something. Um, and that was the uh, that was the impetus for me to want to for for me to try to contact him because I uh, you know I was like wow this guy looks sounds like a badass um, and uh, you know I got I got I got uh, a no but uh, and that that meant a lot too just because it's like you know you feel seen and you know here we are. Let me let me just add a few comments to this. You know, I had a similar moment for myself when I was 15 in India, and we'd go to Old Delhi. I was lived in uh, in the military part of Delhi, Delhi Cantonment, and I'd go to Old Delhi 
every weekend to go rent old magazines because this was the only way you got access to magazines. Um, and I read a story about Andy Grove, a Hungarian immigrant, starting Intel. I must have been uh, 15. Uh, and I said, boy, that's cool. I want to do that. I want to start my own company. Now, be yeah, fair, I lived, I was in the Indian Army. My father and family were in the Indian Army. I'd actually never known anybody in business or technology. And I fell in love with the idea. So I had my own role model in Andy Grove. Um, and, and that started it off. Um, there's probably another question in here that, that uh, Chamath's story brings out, which is, yes, I did go to India before my eldest kid was five and my youngest kid was 10 days old. Uh, and I was a Kleiner, we moved the whole family to India and I'd go back and forth every six weeks because I wanted my kids to know their grandparents and the Indian environment. And before starting school seriously was the best time to do it. But what's interesting about it, and this was 93, um, I had 40 hours of flights each uh, 10, 20 hours each way every six weeks. And I always thought the best way to use that time is learn something new. And I vividly remember reading about the internet and uh, where things were going now. The internet was this other thing. There were these new things called bulletin boards. Um, if any of you, most of you are probably too old, uh, too young to remember that. But my point is curiosity and role models make a huge difference. Yeah. You know, Jamal, that's uh, absolutely incredible. Um, I just want to kind of preface this to, to, our, to our audience, all, all the students. So we're going to split this in, in three sections. We're going to talk about life and risk taking. We're going to talk about just the future of tech. And we're also going to then cover uh, career and just where education is going. And uh, we'll then have a Q&A section for, uh, for our keynotes here. So if you have any questions, you can just put them on Hopin or, or on, on Twitter or, or any of the social media we're using. And we'll be able to collect them and ask them at the end. So as you see a lot more interesting anecdotes that, uh, that you hear from our Vinod and Chamath, uh, be sure to write them down and post them so we can collect them and ask them in about 40 minutes. Um, those are really interesting points. And I think that that's super meaningful. Um, especially when you are super young or in university and that sort of belief that somebody has in you uh, really impacts um, how your uh, career uh, moves on. Uh, Vinod, I wanted to kind of dig a bit deeper into what you just said. You've also been very persistent and driven um, throughout your careers. There's been numerous interviews I've seen where you've talked about just sitting at the client's lobby and waiting for them to come in so you can close a deal to uh, to one time where you uh, showed up at Stanford uh, because you didn't get in and uh, hoping that somebody would just not show up and you may be able to take their spot. Um, how sort of did that end up happening and sort of where does that persistence come from? Is there a key motivator behind that? You know, uh, there's really two kinds of people, I think, fundamentally. When something's hard, some people focus on why it can't be done, and others ask, how can it be done? I've just always belonged to the second category. So I sort of say think everything can be done till proven otherwise, and, uh, I, and because of that, to be honest, uh, I will tell your audience, I have probably failed at more things than anybody in that audience uh, or anybody I've met personally because I tried many more things. Uh, you are referring to the story. I Actually, the real story is I applied to business school uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon doing my master's in biomedical engineering. I applied to business school at Stanford because I wanted to get to the Silicon Valley and start a company. And they turned me down because I didn't have work experience. So uh, while I was at Carnegie, I got two full-time jobs. And they were truly full-time, 40 hours a week jobs. And I applied again the next year because they told me I needed two years of work experience. Uh, so I got two years of work experience in one year. 
Um, uh, we can uh, come back to this issue of overconfidence. I had overconfidence. <laughs> they turned me down again the second time. Uh, they didn't. Th they didn't think it was funny that I got two years of work experience, um, and so in, uh, I decided I'd wage a campaign, and I got to know everybody in the Stanford Business School admissions office, and and, and frankly, just kept talking to them. Um, the director of admissions uh, uh, put me on the wait list just to get me to stop bugging him. I don't think he had any intention of letting me in. Uh, and once I was on the wait list, I kept track of uh, which candidates had accepted uh, and which had declined um, admission. And, and I kept this up. Uh, school at Carnegie Mellon starts in the first week of September, right after US Labor Day. Um, I actually joined the business school at Carnegie Mellon as a backup strategy, but still kept harassing Stanford. And then one of the women in the admissions office told me the student was dropping out about three or four days before classes started. This was three weeks. It was probably around September 20th. I was already three weeks into my classes at uh, Carnegie Mellon MBA program. And I called the admissions office uh, officer and said, look, this person's dropped out. I'm coming. And I literally showed up the next day. Uh, didn't worry too much that I had no way to pay my fees or uh, uh, pay my rent. And this woman actually put me up in our house because I didn't have a place to stay. Um, uh, and, and that was the true story. But... Uh, you know, I never gave up on the idea that I'd, I'd get there because I wanted to do a startup in Silicon Valley, even in 1978. That's absolutely amazing. And, and I think this is a not just an example of persistence, but also risk taking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and maybe just I'll kind of flip that to, to Jamat. Uh, Jamat, you, you have a very uh, strong views on and, and similar points on how risk taking should be done um, as you've kind of talked at this event for the pa past couple of years, but also just online. And uh, you've been extremely successful in, in taking several risks across various industry, whether that's healthcare and or space exploration or, or enterprise software, and not just on the, the venture side, but also on just other personal life uh, areas like, like poker. Um, how do you kind of think about risk-taking yourself uh, from a career standpoint and sort of what parallels do you see on, on how that um, uh, uh, is similar to Vinod's uh, perspective on, on life? Well, I think I think VK and I have one very powerful thing that was going for us when we were young, which is that neither of us had much to lose. Um, and I think that that is uh, an incredible gift, actually. You know, if you think about it, like what is the worst that happens? okay, he gets rejected and then he continues at CMU. He still would have been Vinod Kosa in my opinion, but the point is he didn't have much to lose. Um, you know, in, in a lot of the times in my life that risks that I've taken, um, I could pretty easily underwrite because the in failure, you know, I would have learned something. It would have been an interesting thing. And, you know, I would have moved on and these were never life or death decisions. Um, and so I think the, you know, the thing that I've really been blessed with is, you know, um, not really having high expectations. Um, and that is a gift. That sounds kind of crazy, but it's not. If you think about, you know, um, what is it like to be Bill Gates's children? It's hard. You got to think it must be super, super, super hard. You know, what is it like to be Elon Musk's kids? It will be very, very hard. Um, so I think that, you know, we benefited from, you know, being immigrants to a completely different country where, you know, chutzpah is rewarded, um, where, you know, probably nobody could pronounce his name at the time and nobody can still pronounce my name today. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and I think that that's, that that's really nice. You know, it keeps you grounded and it keeps you grinding. Um, and then all of a sudden risk is, you know, uh, you know what Vinod said earlier, so true. It's like, you can try so many things and learn so much because you can frame things uh, in just a very different way, which is sort of like knowledge and wisdom. And the pursuit of that is so much more interesting than, you know, accolades and the like. So I don't know. I, I really think it comes down to um, making sure that uh, you are not 
convincing yourself that you have so much to lose. Yeah, there's Chamat said something I want to emphasize. You can focus on accolades in life. And I think one of the fundamental issues I see in law change is most people do what is expected of them. It could be career, getting into the right school, getting the next promotion, um, working at a name brand company. So you can do what expectations others set for you. Or you can do what you believe in. And I've never really worried what others think. I've sort of focused on what I believe in and, and tried to pursue that. Um, and, and I'd urge all of you to think about what you really believe in. Now, I'll be honest, I'd be shocked if uh, even 5% of you did what you believed in versus what your parents, friends, others expect you to do. And that's a really important test to put yourself through. Um, and and I, I actually fundamentally believe people are happier when they do what they believe in as opposed to what's expected of them whether it's promotions or careers or big titles or better cars or better houses or whatever you think. No, that's, uh, I think this is like a really interesting point that helps set the base for the next topics we have because um, you're fundamentally describing your upbringing, setting you up for what you're doing now and, and that gives you a much bigger tolerance for what you can lose or, or what you may be left with. And, uh, and this is kind of where I want to focus on uh, on a section that's specifically around um, just the future of technology. You've been really pioneers in investing in, in industries that nobody would look at or, or maybe ten, look at 10 years uh, later. And uh, and we have a questions around just where, where that's going, um, especially as the last 12 months have been very interesting for the rest of the world. And to, to talk about that, I want to bring on Liam Horn, who's also one of the co-founders of Hack to North. And, and Liam can, I, uh, can I just make a comment on, Absolutely. before we go on to the next topic, on this risk-taking issue? because I think there's a very, very important lesson in my story. Uh, most people don't realize that when I started Sun with Scott McNeely, we started another company a month earlier. And when I see audiences like this, I always ask them, do you remember what company I started and failed at? And nobody can tell. It was a company called The Data Dump. Um, and my point is the following. Your failures don't matter if they're manageable failures. My life wasn't going to end if the data dump failed. Uh, I'd be a little bit behind on my rent, but I'd pick up and start again. Um, and, and we started both data dump and Sun about a month apart, same founders, uh, and my point is failure doesn't really matter if it's not going to kill you. Success, on the other hand, everybody remembers 40 years later. Uh, and it changes your li uh, life. And frankly, the failures also are probably one of the more important learning moments in your life. So I, I just want to emphasize what seems like a large risk may actually in the context of 10, 20 or 30 years be a very small risk because nothing about you changes. Maybe you're a little bit smarter. <laughs> That's about it. it. Right. I can't, wait, hold on. Kartik, I have a question for the note. Yeah. Okay, what, what are your relationships like and what are your memories like of those early days at Sun and like working with Andy and Bill and Scott? Like what? What do you remember? Like, what what makes you nostalgic about that? Well, I, I think, look, it was really my first real job. I'd done another startup called Daisy Systems, which was also quite successful, went public. But it was the first time um, I actually got to understand what people are like and how important people are. Daisy had great outcome not great people. Um, and I, I can go into those stories that take forever. Uh, son, you realize people, uh, 
had very different perspectives. You know, the four founders at Sun uh, were so different in both their beliefs, their upbringing, where they came from, how they thought. And I got to appreciate that quite a bit. And that's probably the most vivid learning. Uh, the other learning, which may be relevant to your audience, one of the very unusual things, and I had no idea what I was doing, but I insisted on hiring everybody really good, mostly because I just wanted to talk to them. So if you look at, and I've been meaning to do this, out of the first 15 people, how many billion dollar companies were started? My bet is Sun was as successful, maybe more successful than PayPal, which is cited as a recent example. But not only that, you know, we hired people, Eric Schmidt, we hired in our first year. It was wow. in 1982 that he came to work for me as VP of engineering. Carol Bartz, who went on to be CEO of Autodesk and Yahoo, was in our first 15 people. There were at least, uh, out of the 15 people, at least a dozen companies were created. And it speaks to the question you asked, which is, I realize how much talent matters, whether you need them or not in the current context. Because when we were so small in our first year, we didn't need a lot of the talent. We were telling a machine and selling it. We hoped someday to do distributed file systems, but nobody cared. Nobody wanted distributed file systems. But we hired the people just to play around. Uh, so I, I always say my favorite saying is there's a huge difference between a zero million dollar company and a zero billion dollar company. And that's how you think about yourself and how much you hire whether you hire in the ilk of a zero million dollar company or a zero billion dollar company, and they're different teams. Most people don't realize that when Sun started, Andy Bechtelsheim was a graduate student at Stanford. He developed sort of the Sun workstation idea. He had licensed it to six other people at $10,000 a pop. And Andy, uh, when I approached him, I said, I want you to give up your PhD and join me. He said, I'll license it to you. It's only $10,000. And I said, I'd rather split my equity with you. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll split my equity with you, but I want the goose that laid the golden egg. I just don't want the golden egg. And that, in retrospect, made all the difference in the world mm. because it wasn't the golden egg that mattered. It was his class of thinking, his style of thinking, his constant evolution. And I still learn from him whenever I talk to him. Wow, that's a, that's a really interesting, uh, that's amazing. that memory lane. Um, uh, by the way, one of the six startups was funded by John Dewar at Kleiner Perkins a company called Simlink. Hmm. Wow. But um, I had the person who could keep doing what he had done in, in designing the Sun workstation. So, so I think this is the, the right time to dig into what the next few decades may look like. So I'll, I'll let Liam Horn um, hop in. Cool. Um, thanks so much, guys. Um, and again, like this is so awesome to see having been able to see you guys at pre uh, previous Hack the Norths over the years. And what I wanted to kind of take the conversation towards is the future. And the thing that shocked me uh, now, I'm you know, six years into my career, maybe seven years into my career, is that, you know, I, when, when Karthik and Kevin and I were starting Hack the North and we were there with all these engineers and these students, uh, we were just kind of dreaming about what we wanted to build in our careers. But then, you know, it went really quickly. And a lot of people that I met at Hack the North and friends that I you know, um, got at Hack the North are now founding companies. Um, they're making really ambitious bets in technology themselves. They've joined ambitious startups and they're actually the ones building the future. So what I wanna to try to get at um, is what are the things that you think are important for the students in the audience to be thinking about in the future? Um, so um, 
you know, I want to start with Vinod. Basically, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome question. Is why do you think right now is is a great time to be excited about the future, and, and what are you excited about? Pramod, you want to go? Uh, no, go ahead, BK. You start. So I, I'm sort of very fortunate, uh, but I've always viewed it this way. When I did my first startup, I figured uh, McDonald's was a pretty good meal. I don't, didn't have a lot of expectations. I had a one-bedroom studio in uh, San Jose, and I felt like I was very comfortable in life, and so I didn't need a lot of income. Um, about a few years ago, when I turned 60, I'm 65 today, I had sort of the same kind of, uh, I, I don't need any anymore, what should I work on? Uh, retiring seemed like a really boring idea. Um, sailing sounded boring. Beaches sounded boring. He uh, said, what should I work on? What would motivate me? And I actually wrote a 50-page document called Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology. Um, the basis for that was, I thought, Oh, it'd be nice to take on large problems and work on them. And so I started thinking about what I could work on. And I took all of US GDP and asked the question, what parts could be radically innovated with technology? And I was shocked to learn, and this was over an August break I had, that there was no part of non-governmental GDP that I couldn't think, sitting there alone, think of ways to renovate and radically innovate. And by that, I mean not 5, 10, 20, 30% improvements, but 100, 300, 1,000% improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, so the good news for all of you is this document, which is 50 pages long, was I published in Medium about three, four years ago, um, says that there is almost nothing that can't be radically reinvented. Uh, whether it's space, and we did Rocket Lab about four or five years ago, whether it's 3D printing houses, which we are doing, whether it's reimagining re food like impossible foods, which we did. Um, they really, and, and in fact, my most recent project is one of the most exciting things, reinventing public transit. Like take on a large problem and say, how could you do it very, very differently with technology? And, and the problem uh, I ended up formulating for myself was pretty simple. I said, about 700 million people on the planet live a rich lifestyle. And by that, I mean rich in education, rich in energy, the cars we drive, rich in housing, rich in um, entertainment, uh, rich in healthcare. It's a rich lifestyle. Now, 7 billion people want it, and you can't go from 700 million to 7 billion by linear extrapolation, we'd kill the planet if we took 10 times more steel, 10 times more cement. Um, so um, that was the pieces. And what was shocking to me is I was able to figure out how one might approach having one-tenth amount of cement used for the same amount of housing. One tenth or materials, at least, uh, cement is too restricting. One tenth the carbon emissions, one tenth the amount of steel, one tenth the amount of land area for food production. All that just actually, I was shocked and I was really excited. So, health permitting, I sort of have a very clear plan the next 25 years. And for public consumption, it's in this document called Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology. So it can be done. People always say, uh, start with as naysayers, how can you change food? Uh, how can you change housing? Um, you can, and a lot of it is defined in this document. So hopefully it's motivation. Uh, by the way, six years ago, I'd written a doc different document called 20% Doctor Included. I said, how would I change medicine? 
And I'd looked at this problem coming from India as the following way. And I'd started the very linear way to think about it. Hey, the doctor-patient ratio in the US is X. If I want the same ratio, how many doctors do I need in India? In 30 years, could I start enough medical schools and train enough professors to teach at those schools and how many doctors would we have? Even if I had an unlimited budget, and the answer I came up was, it wasn't possible. And so the greatest thing is when you run into a problem that's not solvable, that's when 11 years ago, I first wrote a blog called, Do We Need Doctors? It came from this analysis. And then I evolved the thesis around how AI could do most of medicine. And that I wrote a 100-page detailed thesis called 20% Doctor Included, which is also on our website on how to change medicine, how to make it 10x cheaper and substantially higher quality. So I, I've been working on that also. So my, my point is the following. Almost every area is open for innovation and you guys, young people have many more tools than we had. So the pace of innovation will accelerate and the opportunities will accelerate. Sorry, Chamath, uh, I, I should let you talk. No, that's good. Um... Uh, my version uh, of this is I'm governed by, at first, what I would have called a lot of um, anger and insecurity, and now I would say is more um, motivation, which is this idea of evening the starting line. So a lot of the things, the projects that I do, um, I'm motivated to answer this question, will it even a starting line? You know, will it make it more fair for everybody? Um, and to be really honest with you, in the first version of social capital, it was sort of one day waking up and realizing I was spending so much time, you know, I talked to Vinod about this two weeks ago, like in, you know, uh, approving enterprise software investments, thinking to myself, this is a horrendous waste of my, my life, quite honestly. Not that enterprise software is bad, but, you know, to me, it just didn't, um, it, it didn't meet this simple boundary condition. So the things that I think about a lot now, um, are things where I can accelerate ideas that sort of already exist, um, but do it in a better way that I think the result uh, is a is an even starting line. So um, there's a lot of reasons why, for example, I've spent some time in space. It's because the innovation cycle in space, because of the boundary conditions, because of the physics, it's so difficult that you can elegantly degrade those technologies to be useful um, you know, near the surface of the Earth. And so, you know, for example, like, you know, suborbital space flight is a precursor to um, intercontinental hypersonic flight, you know, as an example, right? So you take a 15-hour flight and you make it 45 minutes. That's incredibly transformational for GDP, as an example. Um, you know, I'm really fascinated in the move to climate change. And specifically, you know, we have a, a huge problem, which is um, the geopolitics around climate change are very complicated. And the underlying implication there is that, you know, access to the raw input materials are going to be constrained over the next 20 or 30 years. So back to what Vinod said, it's so true. If you have an imperative to get to carbon neutrality because of rising sea levels or, you know, migration patterns or food insecurity or and political insecurity, and you can't get access to the raw materials because China decides to not give it to you, it's a really big problem. And so I've been spending a lot of time learning about material science, new polymers, new synthetics, new composites, um, you know, ways in which we can really radically improve what happens today. Um, and so th those are sort of like the lenses in which I look at things. But in all of these things, at least one or two degrees from whatever I find interesting in the moment must be this answer. Does it even a starting line somehow? Um, and I, I think that that's actually, you know, it's not a very ambitious um, technological goal per se, but I think it is the governing motivator for a lot of people, you know, is sort of closing this gap of inequality that people feel. And I think that if that doesn't happen in the next 20 years, you're going to have a lot of regressive politics that will slow everything down. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about things right now. I would uh, agree with Chamath, the single biggest risk, the single biggest risk society faces, I think, is the inequality. 
The second biggest risk society faces is climate change. And I put it second only because we have a little more time to solve it. But I think uh, the politics of inequality are, can be explosive, and we've seen some of it, but only the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, when people ask me about a country like India, uh, I say the most dangerous thing we can do is leave, for example, the Muslim population behind, which is in, unfortunately happening. Um, so those are two very large problems. And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, when I turned 40, I actually looked at both these problems, say, what should I spend my time on? And I ended up doing a lot of work, work with Professor Yunus, very, very closely worked closely with him and spent a lot of time on the microfinance. We still probably do, uh, we as a venture fund will never invest in a technology that's socially negative, we'll do some neutral things. But I personally spend all my time on socially positive things. Now, climate is the other big issue. Many of you think of me as a climate investor. And it's a much simpler problem. A few months ago, I actually, and this, this piece of encouragement to your young audience, uh, I think to solve climate, you only need a dozen entrepreneurs. And I defined in this blog, sources of 80 to 90% of all emissions on the planet and the dozen technologies that could solve them. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example. QuantumScape is a battery company, did a SPAC about three months ago, two months ago. Um, now we're 20 billion, but we started with the idea that we needed to make electric cars cheaper and more convenient than internal combustion engine cars. So the charging time for a car, we set at, if you go to a gas station, pop in to buy a soda and come out, your car's charged. It should be able to do that. Uh, um, and it has to cost half as much and have, go twice as far. And QuantumScape's done that. Took a long time, took 10 years. Um, we have a similar project in aviation fuel, which is a large source um, of carbon emissions in a company called Lanza Tech. Um, we, Impossible Foods was this effort to free up 80 to 90% of the land area for animal husbandry. Um, that was how that project started. We have another project to uh, make cement uh, without carbon emissions. It's probably a radical project that I'm really, really excited about. I'm almost certain that technology will work. But we also have a project to use one-fifth amount of materials in 3D printing buildings using photopolymers. So there are unusual solutions to all this. To be honest, the only area I can't yet define a clear path to carbon emissions is HVAC. Heating and air conditioning is the one area where I haven't seen a breakthrough. Almost all other areas, at least you can say, this is where this path is worth investigating. Uh, but I'd urge people to look at this climate blog I wrote about the, uh, the, the, the approach we need to take. It's much simpler than it's made out to be. Mm. And I cover most emissions in this blog. That, that's great. Thanks so much. You also touched on a lot of the types of things I wanted to get into detail on. And so what I think would be great, actually, is to transition to the next section, which uh, we'll check, Kevin will introduce, um, around thinking about your career and how you actually think about working on those problems. Hey, guys. It's great to see you both again here, Vinod and Chamath. Um, yeah, I wanted to pivot quickly over to kind of more like college focused, um, just given kind of the audience. Um, so in thinking about how, I guess, one should spend their time in college as a student, um, Vinod, the last time you were at Hack the North, one thing that really stuck with me is you really advocated for something that you call a liberal sciences education, um, which roughly speaking, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like 
students should spend a lot of time investing in a, a strong foundational understanding in the STEM subjects, um, in addition to the more liberal arts kind of education where you learn how to think, write, and communicate. Um, and to the extent that you've described like liberal arts in and of itself on its own is sometimes useless. Um, so I actually first want to get Chamath's thoughts on this because Chamath, I know you spend a lot of time thinking about education as well. So yeah, for the college kids out there. I, um, I was never a particularly good student. I mean, I was reasonably good, but not particularly good. Um, I felt very constrained in my electrical engineering degree because I didn't have any um, electives. I had like four or five through the whole program. And so it took me a long time to figure out what I liked. Um, I, um, I think that people's brains are fundamentally different today than they have ever been. I think that, you know, you talk to a 19 year old, you know, they're multitasking five separate things at the same time. I just think that their ability to concentrate is different. And so the way that they learn has to be different. Um, I'm not sure in 20 years, people will be reading books. I think that people will be reading, you know, or hearing, you know, Blinkist audio summaries of books. Like, so things are moving to more smaller and smaller quantum. And so I think that there has to be a way in which education allows you to meander more. You know, like a lot of my nights and evenings are spent reading. Uh, I, I read an enormous amount, um, but it's like, you know, reading something. I'll read one of VK's blogs. I'll end up on, you know, Wikipedia. Then I'll end up reading a scientific paper. Then I'll end up over here, over here, over here. Next thing you know, like four hours have gone by, but I feel more educated. The problem is I can't prove to anyone that that's happened. Um, and so I agree with him. Like there's a there's a certain amount of learning that has to be wrote um, and measured in a typical way, because those are very good building blocks. And I think STEM is that foundational building block. Um, but I do think we need to find a way for people to be more curious and meander. Um, and I think in that you'll find these things that matter to you, you know, the things as, as Vinod said that you believe in. Um, and it, it took me a really long time, um, but I found it. So my presumption is most people, at least of my generation or VK's generation, have never found it. Yours is probably the path where because you're iterating so quickly, you could find it faster. And so to find it in your 20s and 30s is such a huge win because then you're compounding knowledge in the thing you believe in for 50 years versus 15 years. Um, so uh, I don't know, skip school, go on Wikipedia. <laughs> you know, any response to what Shamath is saying? Yeah, so let me clarify because uh, it was four or five years ago I essentially wrote a blog. It was in Medium, so people can still find it saying, uh, does, is liberal arts a waste of time, basically? And I argued it was because what liberal, uh, what a liberal education was intended to be wasn't what liberal arts programs were today. So my critique wasn't behind the original thinking behind liberal arts. In fact, I referred to, if I remember right, it's been a while, the original purpose of liberal arts education was to be an intelligent citizen in Greece, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so what I defined was what would your education be if the main goal was not necessarily STEM? And by the way, the sciences were part of the liberal arts, uh, almost never used today in the definition of a required liberal arts curriculum. Um, my, my two bases were, one, your education forms the basis of learning. You don't learn things, especially in undergraduate ed education. You build the basis to learn any new thing you want to learn. The second was how to be uh, uh, an intelligent citizen, uh, uh, something I called modern thinking. And I suggested that the name liberal arts, which is now meant to be in college, a way to get through college easily. Uh, and turn it into a rigorous program called the modern thinking. So you could read something like The Economist. And whether it was an article on the arts or an article on the world economy or politics or science, 
you could have an intelligent understanding and ask intelligent questions. I think that's what I argued for in this blog. Unfortunately, most liberal arts students who didn't get a thorough education didn't even understand what I was saying, uh, which proved my point. <laughs> I wasn't arguing for an engineering education, but a very different education. So you can't do philosophy without doing philosophical logic first, mm. you know, for example. You know, you can do a second language, which can be pretty worthless, or you could do linguistics, which actually is a much more important mental model to have in your head as you go about learning in the future. So it was a fairly nuanced kind of blog, and I still believe that. Awesome. Um I guess to riff off of that, one other thing um, that at least was top of my mind, and I'm sure is top of mind for a lot of people, um, when they're making decisions for where to put their career geographically, um, is that location bit, right? And so in the last couple of months, we've definitely seen like just people, lots of people being very vocal um, about leaving Silicon Valley to go to other places like, you know, Texas or Miami. Um, and I'm interested in what you guys think, like, what, what does that mean? for the future of, of Silicon Valley. And if either of you could start, your, if we're, I guess, in the shoes of a college student and we're about to start your career, like in a couple months, um, at the first job out of college, like where geographically would you go? Um, yeah, Shamath, we can start with you. Um, and honestly, I would still come to the Valley. I, uh, I, I think that, you know, all of this is much ado about nothing in many ways. I just think that people are spending an enormous amount of time, you know, talking about where they're going to zoom into meetings of engineers in Silicon Valley from. Uh, <laughs> so I just think the whole thing's a fucking joke. Um, it's not, this is all window dressing. Look, at the end of the day, um, this has been the heartbeat. It will change over time. Um, but I was so, I remember the first day I, I got here, uh, you know, this kid from Canada and I was in Silicon Valley for the first time. And I was like, wow, I, I, I'm here, this is it. And I, I've told this story before, but I was driving on the 101. This is right before the 101 highway. This is right before the internet bubble burst. And Forbes had bought a huge ad as soon as you entered uh, Menlo Park that said, high octane capitalism ahead. It's the craziest things you remember 20 some odd years later. Um, but this is the place. The people are incredibly special. Um, I think San Francisco may have lost its way a little bit, but you know, people in the Valley have always been kind of grinding on interesting things. The other, you know, there'll always be other places to go, but I wouldn't worry about that decision. I, I would just try to get here, get some, find some interesting people, work at an interesting company, learn, and then take some risk. But uh, I, I wouldn't be running to some of these places just because, you know, you're going to be one of the very few and you're almost there to prove a point, which I just think misses the mark. I would agree completely with Shamat. In fact, it was in 2005 or so that Larry Ellison said, innovation is dead. I don't know how many people remember that. Um, and so when Oracle decided to move its headquarters from Silicon Valley, I, my tweet was, I'm glad to see it because it makes room for newer, younger, more innovative minds than an old ossified company like Oracle. Uh, so we do need to make room for newer people, and I'm sort of glad the phenomena is happening. It makes room for all of you to come here. Look, most of the learning you do will be from friends, from acquaintances, from company. It won't be formal meetings over Zoom. It'll be the community you live in, the talks you can go to, the Stanford professor or whoever you can listen to or the entrepreneur. And, and that activity is still in the Valley more so than other places. I like to say Silicon Valley isn't a place, but it's a culture, it's a permissive culture. And it's a culture where if you're a senior executive at a big company, it's generally a bad thing. And if you're a young scrappy entrepreneur, it's a good thing, socially speaking. And that culture can be duplicated in other places and starting to happen. Israel has some of that. Uh, I've noticed some of it around Toronto and Waterloo. Um, you see it in Bangalore a little bit. 
uh, Shanghai a little bit. So it, it will happen, and I think the world will be a better place if more of this happens in other places. But Silicon Valley is still the place where you get the most. And if I were young, this is where I'd want to come. Like I wanted to come here uh, what, uh, 40 some years ago. Awesome. Okay. So it's mostly because who you can learn from and the interactions you can have. Yeah. The people definitely do make the place. Um, so just kind of one more thing kind of in, in closing um, now we're kind of running up against time now. Um, so as you both know, there's roughly like 3000 people kind of watching this live stream right now. They're about to embark on a 36 hour journey um, of creation through this hackathon. And most of them are kind of like, the 18 to 21 year old student type demographic who are interested in like building things in science and technology. So for closing thoughts, like Vinod, I'd love to start with you. What kind of career advice would you want to leave um, with these students who are, if they're considering like going to a large, big tech company uh, versus joining a startup? So look, I'm biased. Uh, I'm sort of startups by religion. <laughs> um, you know, there's good training you can get in somewhat larger companies. Uh, size doesn't matter, but the rate of change in the environment you get into. So you, if you get to Google in some area that's changing rapidly, you're going to learn a lot more than if you go into an area that's static. Um, and, you know, if you look at Oracle SQL database, it's a pretty static area. Uh, you can go to other places that are much more dynamic in the same area. So um, I think the rate of change matters and you learn more when there's more change. I would say uh, smaller companies, there's less permission needed to learn more things. So that generally improves your learning and learning from others is very valuable. I would say one thing broadly. I like to say the future is not knowable, but it's discoverable and it's inventable. In this model, you have to mentally think about, you don't know where you're going except directionally, and you try lots of things, you fail in small ways, and then hopefully get successful in a large way. Uh, Nassim Taleb has written a lot about this asymmetry as being critical. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So you want to make sure you don't get killed. Uh, uh, but generally, you can discover the future or invent it. And I like to tell people, don't extrapolate the past, invent the future you want. And it's much more doable than people think. I also fundamentally believe most people can do much more than they think they can. And they're limited not by what they can do, but what they think they can do. I would tell you, do not go to the big tech companies. Um, the thing that's changed is that these big tech companies now use money basically as green mail. And so the worst thing you can do in your early career is to all of a sudden get addicted to $500,000 a year, and as a result, become so lazy as to have a chance of missing out on $500 million. Um, and I think that that's very likely because these companies now basically pay you so much to go into static businesses to do nothing, uh, but you make enough where you get uh, disillusioned and you get risk intolerant. But the problem is that there is so much asymmetric upside for anybody to take risk when they're in their early 20s. And it just decays over time unless you prepare and train your mind to have that mindset. And so where I would have told you 10 or 15, 20 years ago, there was enough dynamic change to keep big companies honest. It was worthwhile going because you would have gotten some good training. Here now, the very large companies, I think, are extremely static. I think that they use money as a way to take very talented, smart kids and basically put them on the bench so that they never really exercise their full capability it's tragic. And so I would go to startups. I would not go to these big tech companies. Yeah, I like to say to reinforce that idea, most interesting things happen at the edges of a system 
not in complete chaos and not uh, in ossified conventional wisdom or old companies or where the rate of change is small. So seek out those edges where things may be changing. Um, in, and the second thing I would say is I've seen no large change driven by a big company or a large institution of any site. It's almost always the entrepreneurs driving large change. Awesome. Vinod Chama, thank you so much. Um, I will pass it over to Kartik. We've been collecting some audience questions um, through our socials that we'd love to, to pass on to you guys now. So back to Kartik. Thanks, Kevin. So um, to all of you watching, um, <clears throat> we've we've started to get some questions. I, I think we just uh, switched too early on the slides. Can we go back to, there we go. Uh, we already got a handful of questions and we're gonna be collecting more. So if you have any questions, type them up quickly on Hopin. Uh, there's, a, there's a consistent theme here around planning your, your career post-graduation. So I'll, I'll kind of bring up a couple of them and maybe uh, I'll just list all of them so you can make a coherent narrative that sort of answers a lot of them together. I think that the first kind of question that we have here is um, kind of what advice would you give to, uh, to somebody who's currently feeling lost um, in their university career and wants to explore more than one path uh, of uh, what their future can be? And, and kind of similar to, to that, the, the other theme here is um, does it matter if you uh, don't really perform at the, the highest level, uh, whether that's uh, being able to meet the, the criteria for uh, the highest marks or being able to get the job at the best place right now? How, how do we kind of merge and, and think through that as somebody's thinking about um, their careers after university? Well, that Maybe has to do with one is just the motivation of, again, believing in oneself is about like building up your own self-worth. That's a mental health exercise that is about ignoring how other people define success. It would be nice to get the best grades, not, you know, only one person can be at the top of the class by definition. And so, you know, what are the rest of us supposed to feel? Well, hopefully the rest of us are supposed to feel okay with ourselves uh, because that's not the only definition of success. That's, uh, and so I, 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 do, I think that what this person is asking is something bigger than grades or work or whatever, which is that tying back to your this generation of people in your 20s, again, I think are neurologically very different than us. And as a result, are much more prone to mental health issues. And the reason is because the inputs and the motivations and all of the, the ways in which you consume information are so radically different. Um, and so, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of millions of people giving you signals every day. And I don't know how I would be growing up that way. I was lucky to be grow up with not a lot of that input. And so I could develop myself more. Um, and so I do think that, you know, focusing on how you define success, your own self worth is just a critical building block now that's on par with anything else. And people use the language of that question, I think, to mask what is really more of a mental health exercise, which is like, if you go to the gym, you should be also doing this. It's just that important. If you're eating reasonably good food, you should also be doing this. And what this is, is figure out a way to define your self-worth. Um, it is, I think it's a very important exercise for people. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I said earlier, you want to be internally driven, not driven by expectations of others for you. Uh, I think that's what Chamat just said. Uh, I would answer uh, with some additional guidance. First, there's a good balance between really focused and exploratory. And earlier in your life, exploring multiple areas is not a bad thing. Uh, I actually suggest uh, everybody doing computer science also do neuroscience. Just learn across disciplines in and this isn't a license to not do anything. It's a suggestion that the main learn focus should be your rate of learning. So as you try different things, if you're lost, you focus on what are you learning, how rapidly, and maybe use that as a guidance. At some point, you also have to take responsibility and get some things done. But there's a balance between exploration and learning and getting things done. 
Um, but especially early, especially at 20, I wouldn't be too worried about lack of focus if your rate of learning is high. Amazing. And it's uh, not a license to be lazy. It's a license <laughs> to work hard at a lot of uh, other things that you might learn from. This is great. I, I think you know, there's a question for you from one of the answers you gave, uh, and that is if, if you believe that the focus on inequality is the, the biggest problem that we should solve, um, how can uh, students get started to, uh, to contribute towards solving that? You know, uh, there's no one answer to this. I wish there was. If you ask me the question, is there one answer by t uh, in 25 years? Yes, in my view, there is. I think some of the technologies, AI among them, will make the production of goods, services, et cetera, relatively free. And we won't have to worry about this notion of income. So the least common multiple of goods, services, and the richness of lifestyle will be much, much higher, multiplied by the technology I've talked about. So... Between now and then, we can't let it wait for 25 years or 2045 for that to happen. We have to pay attention to the issue and work hard on it. Uh, uh, about five years ago, I wrote a piece in Forbes saying AI will be cause great disruption, great productivity growth, great GDP growth, and increasing income inequality. That was about five years ago, uh, the first time I wrote about universal basic income. I do think notions like that will have to happen. And anything that enhances that. In the meantime, we, 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 I think especially in the West, especially in the Americas, we've, we are well off enough where just GDP growth is the wrong metric. I actually suggested in a tweet last year that we stop measuring GDP and start measuring the total income of the bottom half of the population mm -hmm. as the key metric for policy. It's amazing. Uh, I think definitely uh, one of the criticisms of GDP is it doesn't account for what the internet's done directly either. So um, I absolutely agree with well, that. Lots of reasons are wrong with GDP, but you know, if policy is geared towards maximize the income of the bottom 50 percent, uh, you might see you might still see inequality, by the way, but you'd see the minimum standard of living much higher and improving and the main purpose of policy. Amazing. So the next question is for you, Chamath. Uh, why are you excited about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I think. Look, if you go back to 18, whatever, um, you know, we are in a, a world where uh, the dollar just fundamentally debases naturally as you print more money, like literally by printing more, um, we actually make every single existing one worth slightly less. So you eventually in a digital economy will have to come and reckon with that. Um, at the same time, the way that people deal with the financialization of all of the things that have happened in the economy is that they try to hedge. And the problem with all of that is that it actually creates very interlinked dependencies. So it's a setup where on the one hand, the core underlying asset that people use to price risk is, you know, uh, it degrades in value by, you know, four or five, six percent in a good year. And in a year like last year, 15, 20 percent, because we printed literally so much money. On the one hand and on the other hand you have fundamental correlated risk with everything so if you want some instrument of value to underpin a digital economy it will have to be a cryptocurrency and the more distributed it is uh, the less manipulated it can be um, and so that's why crypto and and frankly it's why it's why um it's why bitcoin um and then you know, if you then move past that and say, okay, how can we do functional things with all of that? Then you're probably in a world of uh, DeFi and Ethereum and, you know, that stuff. Uh, no, this is absolutely incredible. I think uh, maybe maybe to put you on the spot, I don't think we've heard the notes, uh, comments on, on crypto. 
And I'm curious if you uh, if you share the same opinion as Jamath. So uh, fundamentally, uh, I think uh, I see both the pros and cons. There's a lot of pros, and it helps break the ossified financial system. It bothers the hell out of me if you look at the financial services industry around Wall Street. Wall Street is in the business of helping the business of business, which is manufacturing autos, manufacturing services. And yet, when you look at the cumulative profits of, of the financial services sector, people who are in the business of helping other businesses make more money cumulatively than all the other industries combined. Now, any one year, that may not be true, but I think when I looked at it about five years ago, that was true. That just fundamentally feels wrong to me. And there's two things. One is the ossified system and related regulatory capture that perpetuates that system and crypto frees that up. Uh, decentralization is really, really important. Um, the flip side of it that has bothered me is more crypto has had two uses principally. One is speculation, which I think hurts a lot of people who can't afford to get hurt. And two, the vast majority of real business done with crypto is illegal and to violate regulatory uh, 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 for illegal activity, whether it's drugs or slave trading of children or guns. or And that bothers me a lot, uh, that this has been the principal problem with crypto. Uh, having said that, I fundamentally think uh, the, the, it's, I'm optimistic about where crypto can go. Uh, I want to do a couple more questions and then we'll give uh, give you your time back. Um, question for you, Chamath. Uh, do you think uh, we as a society will be able to handle the negative effects of, uh, of social media? And, and if you think uh, it's it's a lot worse than, than we realize, what is the role uh, technologies and entrepreneurs and engineers uh, can, uh, can play in, in helping solve that? I think we're at the point where, um, you know, we found out that cigarettes cause cancer and we're still feverishly smoking them because we think it still makes us look cool, even though it doesn't particularly add any value. Um, and so, you know, there is going to come a moment, I call it the Mike Bloomberg moment. And Mike, when Mike Bloomberg, who VK and I are both friends with, when Mike became mayor of New York City, you know, one of the first things he did was he banned smoking. And it was a thunderclap. And, now you guys probably don't even think it as abnormal, but you know there were places like we would we could you know again in the '90s you'd still go into restaurants and people would be smoking section and non-smoking section, and after Mike shut down the smoking inside of restaurants and social areas and also you know there was a certain amount of heat within office buildings in New York it was done. There's going to be a there's going to be a moment like that. Now what what is social media good for? Um, I think you're starting to see a migration of behavior so that these tools um, start to become less of a Swiss army knife, meaning it's not the point of, um, you know, one thing to do everything. It's um, it's the point of going to specific tools, specific purposes. So Instagram will be very much fashion related, ultra fashion related, you know, fast fashion, ultra fast fashion, as an example. Um, you know, TikTok will become a much more consumable form of short form video. Um, and it's going to be much more entertainment focused. You know, Twitter is, is becoming much more content focused. And I think that uh, segregation of behavior is the first step. And then the second step is going to be this, you know, like I said, Mike Bloomberg moment where somebody says enough and everybody says, you know what? Yeah, it's just way better without, without somebody, you know, smoking a cigar beside me, it sucks. And secondhand smoke gives you cancer too. Uh, so we haven't gotten to that point yet, but I think that's where it's going. Again, don't work at big tech, don't work at it. <laughs> that's one, uh, one clear takeaway, it seems to be the case. Uh, so 
I'll, we'll do this one, our, our final uh, question uh, to, to you. And I uh, want to thank all the, the time you've given us. And, and with that, um, I want to basically ask uh, as our final question, uh, what is kind of one thing that you wish uh, people would ask you more? Um, and, and we'll kind of just have that be included with any parting thoughts you'd like to share before uh, you sign off. And maybe we can start with Vinod. You know, I don't know. You, you know, I don't know if there's one thing, but I I do think the value of role models is always underestimated. You know, Shamat talked about his role models. Uh, I talked about Andy Grove and Wall Street. I like to say there was a time when the only role models one had was basketball players and football players. In the last 20 years, we've seen a very different model of the Larry Pages or the Jeff Bezos of the world emerge as role models. So I'm, I really wish people would focus more on that, what they've been able to achieve and, and contributed uh, over time. So role models, I think, is the one thing I wish people would ask me more about or talk about. I think that that's amazing. Uh, I, I'll just second that because I think it's it's amazing. BK was a role model for me when I needed somebody to look up to. Um, it also helped for me that um, you know he was South Asian, so he looked like me or I looked like him. Uh, that meant a lot to me. Um, and uh, it, and you know not having met him was fine. Obviously, it was much better after I met him. Uh, but. Um, but having these heroes and then, um, you know, seeing their path and the imperfect path is much more motivating. You know, it's like it's hard to look at LeBron and know that LeBron was the best basketball player since he was 14 years old and have him be your hero. That's impossible, you know, to build on what VK said. But to go through the ups and downs and sort of like, you know, come from, you know, not so high expectations and to be able to achieve things and, you know, have some stumbles and struggles and failures and, I think that that richness is what heroes are about. So I would agree with that. Find find people around that you look up to, and you know, just uh, admire them and just be motivated by them. Shmuel Vinod, uh, it's been great to to see this live and and the relationship that you have here. And thanks again for sharing this with uh, three thousand students. Great, thank yeah. you, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass this on to Jessica and Christine. Thank you, Chamath, Vinod, and Kartik for taking the time to share your experiences with us. That was incredible. So we've said this many, many times before, but Hack the North would not be possible without all of you. You put your schedule on hold to band together with thousands of students across the globe, this time from your own home, to come together, learn new things, and create something great. For all of you disrupting your sleep schedules from different time zones or experiencing intense back pain from hacking from your bed. Thank you for joining us in the next 36 hours to devote your time to making your ideas come to life. Hack the North's mission statement is to empower anyone to dream big. And with this virtual event, we want to help you do just that. It's an honor for us to bring together uh, such a community of inspiring and passionate people, despite the circumstances this year. And we're super excited to see what you build in the next 36 hours. Well, hacking starts at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So in the meantime, head over to the Sponsor Bay here on Hopin, submit a custom emoji to the design contest on Discord, or grab your preferred source of caffeine and get yourselves ready for Canada's biggest hackathon online. Good night. <laughs>